Hello and welcome to another episode of Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear, the podcast conversation about accelerating the transition to a sustainable carbon neutral society. I'm your host, Mitch Ratcliffe. Thanks for joining the conversation today. You know, for many of us, the climate crisis looks like a brick wall, something the internal combustion driven economy is going to slam into and total the system in which we grew up. That impression is exacerbated by cable and social news coverage, which loves a train wreck, especially when it's taking place in slow motion. Our guest today took a deep dive into the world's efforts to turn toward a decarbonized, sustainable way of life. John J. Berger, PhD, is an environmental scientist and policy consultant who has written or edited 11 books, and his new book, Solving the Climate Crisis, Frontline Reports from the Race to Save the Earth, explores the path forward and doesn't get caught up with doomsaying that discourages many people from taking action. Instead, he looks squarely at the consequences of inaction, telling stories about progress in turning the built environment green, the green business erupting in red states, and the many changes in our infrastructure, businesses, and government practices that are being pioneered around the world, as well as the changes we can all make in our own buying, diet, and voting decisions. Solving the Climate Crisis Frontline Reports from the Race to Save the Earth is available on Amazon, at Powell Books, and in local bookstores. Now let's get to the conversation. Welcome to the show, John. How are you today? I'm doing fine. I'm very happy to be here and to join you for this podcast. Well, thanks. It was a pleasure to read your book. And I wanted to start off with uh, I think they're probably the most controversial question, uh, which is that you call out that the two degree centigrade threshold to prevent the worst of climate change is an arbitrary and largely political target that's not backed by specific science. You're not dismissing the concern, but that uh-huh. is kind of a controversial opinion. Based on your research, how bad would a post two degree centigrade world be? Well, let me back up for a moment as I handle your question by saying that two degrees was supposed to be safe. But since we're now at 1.2 degrees centigrade, and that's not safe, it's a no-brainer to see that double that would be unsafe. And this this is a political criterion that came out of some economic research that I think was originally done by Professor William Nordhaus of Yale. Mm -hmm. He ultimately got a Nobel Prize in economics. However, what he's done is really uh, flawed economics and flawed climate science and uh, flawed ethics in discounting the future. Be that as it may, we now know that two degrees centigrade global warming is far from safe and Mm -hmm. also that the world doesn't uniformly warm. So there is no such thing really as a two degrees centigrade hotter world. In the Arctic, it's three to four times as hot as the average um, over the entire surface of the earth. And it's one and a half times as hot on land than it is in water. So this is kind of a misnomer to think that we're just at two degrees, but you asked me how how bad things are gonna get if we go beyond two degrees. And I I wanted to just get to that. Um, Two degrees is going to expose some 420 more million people to extreme heat waves every five years than we would uh, expose at one and a half degrees centigrade. And remember, we're at 1.2 degrees centigrade. The, the, The ecological and physical damage to the planet from climate change gets worse and worse, the hotter things get. And that means that we have to make every effort. It's imperative that we lower that we first that we stop increasing the discharge of greenhouse gas and that we taper it off to near zero so that we're a net zero global economy. Going back to what are some of these consequences that that we want to avoid in addition to people extreming experiencing extreme heat, they're going to experience 
extreme floods, uh, deluges will become more common. There will be more sea level rise as more mm -hmm. ice melts in the Arctic and more glaciers melt that are sources of water. And I know you want to talk later about water scarcity, so we can get into that. But basically, it's going to accelerate the loss and damage to ecosystems and cause more and more animals and plants to go extinct or to shrink their range or to diminish in their abundance. So it's it's going to be disastrous if we continue on this path. And we'll also see more poverty, uh, more war, more resource conflicts, even at a subnational level. And this will cause some tendency for people to call for more order, more authoritarianism, to try to hold back the chaos that will come if we don't change our ways. Well, you, you raise a point in the book uh, about the fact that if we fail to use government now in response to the climate crisis, we're going to end up with even more government. And you also pointed out the fact that there are some far-right movements seeking to protect their way of life. Do you see the social consequences of climate change already taking deep hold? I do. I think that we are already seeing um, some compassion fatigue as one extreme weather event follows on another, and sometimes multiple events are happening. In, in terms of the social impacts, I think in addition to this compassion fatigue or crisis fatigue and the getting numb to suffering, I think that the social safety net can be overstretched and overstressed and begin to fail. And I think we see that as a result of this influx of illegal um, immigration to the United States. And we have people sleeping on the street and we have cities that seem to be incapable of addressing these enormous needs that have been put upon them to, to no small degree because the climate has become more and more inhospitable in, in Mexico and in Central America and in South America. As a result, people are unable to live where they have been accustomed to living and in their rural areas without enough water crops fail, livestock dies, and then people have to move just in order to survive. And they go to the cities and they find masses of other displaced people. So they seek refuge by coming to the United States border and to the borders of the Euro European Union. Well, do you see that uh, the, the response is often to, to, you know, let's build a wall or let's shut down the borders. That seems to me to be uh, uh, already an endemic problem uh, globally. Are we being short-sighted by not spending more to help those people where they are, as well as to reduce the overall impact of climate change around the planet? I agree with that. I think that it is much more cost-effective to try and address um, social needs in Guatemala let's say, or in Honduras or in Mexico than it is in the United States. The whole economy is, is less, it's less expensive to intervene there and to provide aid in a poorer economy than in a wealthy economy. It's a no brainer. So it would be more cost effective for us to spend on uh, correcting, helping to correct the problem where it arises and then making the influx of migrants unnecessary, ideally. Uh, people wonder, however, because the United States itself is beset with all kinds of severe social crises and we have people sleeping on our own streets and people who are going hungry and without housing and addicted to drugs or alcohol. And so the argument often is, well, why should we spend more money on foreign aid? Why should we help other countries deal with climate change when we have so many serious issues to deal with in the, in the United States? And I think the answer is that if we don't deal with these problems abroad, these problems are gonna come home to roost. And for example, 
in a developing country that doesn't have the resources to fund a clean energy transition, they will be burning coal and they'll be adding more greenhouse gas to the atmosphere as we then try to lower the greenhouse gas concentration in the global atmosphere, which is a common resource, we're going to find that our efforts are going to be to an extent undermined by these unaddressed issues. And again, it's more cost effective to address the energy transition in developing countries where costs are lower than it is to to do it here. Well, it of course, the, the global north is responsible for the vast majority of the emissions that have heated the planet already. But many American climate critics will point to emerging nations' use of coal and fossil fuels, as you're, you're talking about, as offsetting our efforts to reduce this. But when you look, for instance, at the progress in China, which might even end up selling a lot of their solutions to the emerging world instead of us providing them as part of our, our uh, foreign investment and part of our economy. Do you think that that criticism of, of third world, or excuse me, that's the wrong term, the emerging nations, is misplaced? Is it? Is it? How should we be thinking about our relationship with the rest of the world as the former leader of the world? I think that we should take responsibility for the actions of the industrialized nations. For example, per capita, the United States emits about fifteen tons of carbon dioxide every year, whereas in poorer countries, the emissions might be on the order of one or two million tons. And in some areas of the world, like um, where there is an advanced renewable energy economy going, citizens might actually be emitting a negative amount of CO2 because they're um, counteracting or um, enabling other countries to avoid emitting greenhouse gases. So I think that what we should do is make good on the promises that we made to the world back in 2009 at the Copenhagen Climate Summit, where we promised $100 billion a year in aid to developing countries. I don't think that we have achieved it. If we have, it's only barely. And much of the aid is actually in the form of debt. And these nations are already struggling under staggering debt loads that have undermined their economies to some extent. So, I think that we need to invest a great deal more in trying to help other nations achieve their energy transition. We also need to invest much, much more heavily in our domestic energy transition. And if you'd like, at some point, we can talk about why that could be very affordable for us to do in the United States and why we are penny pinching and being penny wise and pound foolish on the energy transition, even today in the United States, when we should be an example to the other nations and completely decarbonize here so that we'd have moral stature and authority when we talk to other nations. You you draw a parallel that I think is critical for us to think about and understand, which is the difference between today and World War II, when the mobilization of America was catalyzed by the, the the desire to save democracy, to save the free world from Nazism and from fascism. Why is it so hard, given this bigger existential threat, for us to make that change? Back in the Depression, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt took office, the United States was still a relatively homogeneous country. And Congress and the American people united in support of Roosevelt's New Deal program. He pointed out that the economy needed fundamental systemic structural reform, and he was able to get Congress unified behind that goal. Today, what's different is you have a divided and dysfunctional Republican Congress. We're looking at essentially the degeneration of the Republican Party into a cult of personality led by um, a sociopathic pathological liar. 
and this has led to kind of a divide and rule um, or implementation of that sort of divide and rule philosophy where politicians for their own political ends are trying to play on public um what shall we say, emotional, cultural wedge issues that drive people apart that are not necessarily um, the most important issues for us to be focusing on, but they divert us from focusing on tremendously important crises like the climate crisis. So uh, we're dealing with a divided nation, and we also have a very, very vigorous right-wing media ecosystem led by Fox News that pours out an unceasing stream of lies and distortions and that make heroes of villains and and elevates false gods and idols. And so we're dealing with a lot of myths that we could go on about myths and yeah. Um, and, and the other thing that's really different is that income inequality has become extremely stark and apparently still increasing with a one percent of wealthy people owning 25 trillion dollars of wealth which is as much as the bottom 80 percent of the nation owns plus we're also awash in dark money from powerful special interests that are corrupting the political process we're we're therefore facing a crisis of democracy at the same time as we're facing a crisis in the climate and we're not if, if we lose the fight for democracy we're not going to be able to protect and save the climate obviously money drives both the politics and the the media coverage that you were describing would for instance the uh, repeal of uh, citizens united be an important step that we could make? Are there ways that we could act, notwithstanding the divided Congress we have, we have but is yeah. it, would that fix it if we could make that change? Well, that would be helpful because Citizens United gave personhood to corporations. And as a result, corporations have arrogated themselves the right to basically contribute unlimited campaign contributions and distort the political process. And this is all on top of an enormous amount of, lo of lobbying that takes place in Congress. So this kind of diminishes the voice of ordinary people. I'm not sure if I completely got the, got the whole thrust of your question. If I didn't, please put me back on track. Uh, no worries. Uh, it, it, these are these questions are multifaceted, and I, what I would encourage people to do is read your book because you do dive into much of this in great detail with amazing stories that bring the ideas to life. And I hope they'll take the time to read it. I want to take a quick commercial break. We're going to be right back to continue the conversation. And we are back to continue the discussion with John J. Berger, author of Solving the Climate Crisis: Frontline Reports from the Race to Save the Earth. Now, John, following on the, the political divisions that we were discussing in the first part of the conversation, you took a lot of time in red states and found that they're making the transition too, albeit not for the same reasons as a lot of environmentalists. You shared the story of Dale Ross, who is the mayor of Georgetown, Texas. What changed his, his mind and drove him towards the embrace of renewable energy? He was motivated by the fact that the natural gas producers in Georgetown, Texas, or serving Georgetown, Texas, were uh, offering seven-year contracts, at which time, when they expired, prices could be renegotiated. And energy prices often are very volatile. However, mm -hmm. the renewable energy producers using solar power were offering 25-year contracts, so the price could be fixed and the municipality knew what they were facing in terms of the costs for utility power for the city. So he looked at it as an accountant and he thought, we'll get a better deal economically by going with renewable power. And since solar power depends not on fuels that are volatile, but on the sun, which doesn't alter its price from day to day, they were able to get the stable energy contract. 
later on, they, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, how, you, you went on. It, it wasn't that simple. Uh, he had he had a lot of political conflict within the community, too. He did. And even though converting to renewable energy brought in millions of dollars of investment because um, businesses wanted to be associated with a progressive uh, renewable energy community. And Georgetown was billing itself as 100% uh, clean power. Ultimately, what happened is the cost of natural gas after a few years dropped. And so it looked as if renewable energy was a bad deal because it was being undercut by this short-term drop in natural gas, probably as a result of fracking. So mm -hmm. people were a bit disgruntled. And ultimately, Georgetown took the power that it was generating through its renewable energy contracts, and it gave it to the Energy Reliability um, Council of Texas. And as a result, that power got mixed in to their grid, which has 80% fossil fuels and 20% non-fossil generation. So in effect, Georgetown sold its energy credits so that allowed other people who were polluting to buy the energy credit and thereby continue polluting. So it wasn't really an environmentally sound move, but they did it for financial reasons. The, the original motive that Dale Ross had in going to clean power was purely an economic calculus. And he would say that the environmental benefits come along for the ride. And I think that that's one thing we can take away from this. That it's generally true that renewable energy um, generation decisions are sound economic decisions. They not only produce jobs, but they will ultimately lower costs because we're not constantly buying fuel every year and then lighting it on fire and having to buy it again the following year. We're just paying for the operating cost of the renewal of the wind turbine or the solar um, farm or rooftop solar, and they can be very low. Now, you, you went beyond the United States, traveled all over the world doing research for this book, and, and you found that many cities get more than 70% of their energy from clean sources. But it doesn't just mean, you know, wind and, and solar installations. There's a lot of changes, dynamic changes within the economy. Can you describe what you found in Samso, which is a Danish island, that is already 100% clean, clean energy and carbon neutral? How did the economy change as they made that transition? Well, back in 1998, when Soren Hermansen came back to Samso after having knocked around the world on Norwegian fishing boats, he was um, originally a vegetable farmer, and he was also a high school environmental studies teacher. And he found that Samso had changed. The farming and fishing industries were in decline, and something needed to happen. Jobs were scarce, and Samso was in the doldrums. This is a collection of maybe 22 villages on an island comprising maybe a population of 3,800 people at the time. He had the idea that Samso, instead of spending its money importing increasingly expensive oil to heat the houses and um, burning coal for electricity, ought to convert to renewable energy. And there were some, shall we say, benevolent Danish government programs that he applied to and wrote grants and got funded. And they began building wind turbines offshore. And then they used the wind as a source of electricity. They also used um, weight, forestry waste and straw that the farmers sold to a district heating system. Local plumbers got jobs uh, installing geothermal heat pumps for heat instead of burning oil. And they also got jobs plumbing the this a heat distribution network so that was a a win-win situation they were they were now taking care of their heat and their electrical needs they still have internal combustion vehicles though probably increasingly electric and they have a hybrid electric ferry which they will retire by 2030 
the the bottom line is that they had a very successful uh, series of investments in renewable energy. First, as I said, it was triggered by small amounts of government money, but then local farmers, local co-ops, and the municipality invested in these renewable energy generating facilities. And I would say my guess is by now, they've probably earned well over $100 million in payback from these investments. They've created jobs, they've revitalized their economy. And uh, this is the community I had in mind when I mentioned the community that is net carbon negative and exporting I don't know, 80,000 megawatts of clean wind power to other countries to help them in their energy transition. It's a nice example showing that it is possible to convert virtually entirely to clean energy. And the biomass that they use is net carbon neutral, essentially. And when you burn straw, of course, it doesn't have the same energy density as oil, but it also doesn't produce as much pollution. It's essentially taking the carbon out of the air to grow the grass. And then when it becomes straw, it releases that carbon back to the atmosphere in a sort of net carbon neutral fashion. Now, you it, it continued your research and looked at the work of Stanford University's Mark Z. Jacobson, who has shown that we could get to 100% renewable energy in the United States, but that would require a lot of changes in the grid. How, how, how should we be thinking about rearranging the grid so that we have distributed generation and distribution of power rather than centralized top-down electric, uh, electric power? Well, there's so many issues involved here. We're going to have to expand the grid by two or three times, and it will not only have to be expanded, but it's going to have to be greatly modernized so that it will respond to demand fluctuations and give people credit for reducing their electrical use at times when it's inopportune for the whole system to operate efficiently. And this this type of demand management will have to be built in. The grid will be much more sophisticated. And in terms of distributed versus centralized power, we're going to have a mix of both because um, I, some renewable energy is centralized. If you have a power plant, a solar power plant in the desert or a wind farm offshore, that is a form of central power, even though there are other components of the grid that might be small-scale distributed energy. Let's say Stanford University with its district heating system and other campus-oriented renewable energy system might be an example of a distributed energy grid. Well, that sounds like, first, the basis for creating a lot of good-paying jobs. It, How it, 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 could could I just footnote what, what I just said? When you mentioned Mark Jacobson and, and you mentioned that he has shown that the United States could get all of its power from solar, from wind, from geothermal, from hydro, from wave power without having to create um, electricity from any of the fossil fuels and ultimately without nuclear power as well. But his his findings turned out to be general generalizable to the whole world. He did studies on probably 150 countries using the same analytical models that he applied to the United States. And he found that we are we have vast opportunities to transform the entire global economy to clean energy. And we have virtually all the technology that we need in order to do that with some with some notable little exceptions. What would you say the exceptions? Where do we need to do additional innovation or investment in order to solve well, the We need to do investment and innovation in large fuel cells that are capable of moving um, oceanic cargo vessels, for example, or moving jet fully loaded jet planes on long distance, let's say transatlantic flights, we can already power a small plane to operate on battery electricity. And it's, it's conceivable fairly soon that we'll have electrical 
airplanes for short and medium hops, um, but not for very, uh, not to carry very large numbers of passengers very long distances. We need further innovation there. And we need to develop a more robust system of hydrogen for energy storage to augment um, industrial scale flow batteries and other large um, storage um, systems. I think that that will be very helpful too for heavy uh, trucks, for example, and other construction equipment that we can already power bulldozers and what used to be called steam shovels, but now are called power shovels electrically and electric forklifts. So much of our industrial plant can be powered electrically, including heavy equipment. We need to continue research and development, developing further advances in these areas. But, and you, you went on to explore the idea about how the U.S. could pay for this transition as well as create a more equitable society. Could you share a few of the things that you think we should be considering today? Well, I think we should have more green banks uh, that focus on funding renewable energy and energy transition investments. I think that the United States should begin issuing green bonds instead of just making 38% of all the bond issues treasury bonds. I think they should be green treasury bonds. The treasury itself um, could provide uh, many incentives to the private sector. So taxpayers don't really have to fund the entire energy transition. It, it can be 1% of uh, let's say a, a loan guarantee and 99% comes out of the private sector knowing that the federal government stands behind any any bad loans if the federal government for example wanted to spend only 2% of our gdp something on the order of 50 uh, sorry 500 billion dollars a year the interest cost to borrow that money would be, let's say at 5%, maybe $50 billion a year, but we'd get tremendous bang for the buck. Pardon well, me. And you, point out, you point out that we end up netting out with a profit in the long run because we have, we've, we've cut so many of the costs associated with the harmful way that we live today. Yeah, it's not only that. We think about the costs of making the clean energy transition, but we should think about the investments in a clean energy transition that are cost effective and that will repay us multiple times over, not just in avoiding additional unnecessary climate damage, but in, in the form of a return on investment based upon having lowered our energy costs. So we'll have energy savings that go on this year, next year, and on into the future. The, these investments have been studied and they pay back very, very well. Plus they support a whole echelon of new jobs, new jobs for technicians, for engineers, for for workers, for construction workers, for people installing uh, insulation in buildings or new windows, uh, converting um, a gas furnace to a heat pump system. The, the jobs just go on and on. So I, I like to say that this is the greatest economic opportunity we have, that the climate crisis is paradoxically our greatest economic opportunity to produce jobs and, and economic revitalization. And at the same time, when we do this, if we do it conscientiously, we can address some inequality and, and some past environmental injustice. Well, as scarcity increases, the ability to concentrate wealth also increases. And what we're describing here is an environment in which we eliminate scarcity through the creation of abundant energy. You also talk about uh, in other parts of the book how the world would change if we adopted a plant-based diet, uh, natural solutions to the climate uh, problems, such as uh, biochar and other ways of drawing down uh, anthropogenic CO2. And I urge people to take a, a long read and spend time with this. But you also, even though you're hopeful, you're very cautious. How does continuing to delay 
reduce our ability to respond to the climate crisis or to take advantage of that economic opportunity. Hmm. I, I think we touched on this earlier, that all these problems will be exacerbated by delay. For example, had we begun 30 years ago uh, to gradually transition our economy to clean energy, we would be much farther along. And now, because we've waited until we're in the midst of a catastrophic crisis, everything becomes in a way more expensive when you do it in an emergency and it, you have crash programs and the stresses on society become more extreme as people have to modify um, their, their customary behavior in order to accommodate new technology. There's so many aspects to this, I hardly know where, where to begin. And part of my Part of my thoughts are also with some of the previous questions that, that you asked, which are excellent questions and, and really require almost a treatise to, to answer them properly. We did, write a, we did write a book, and I hope people will read it. <laughs> Thanks. So, Let me ask this. You, near the end of the book, you also say that ordinary citizens really can join this fight. But there are, you know, there are three or five big, often infrequent decisions that they can make to reduce their impact. Could you share what they should be thinking about? Sure, I, I could, I'm happy to do that. One of the biggest energy consumers um, is the vehicle that we drive if we own a car or a truck. So one of the most important decisions we can make is to um, either buy an electric vehicle or a hybrid electric vehicle or use a bicycle if we're gonna go less than three miles and perhaps 60% or so of all trips are under th three or four miles. So many trips could be done by bicycle and that really resonates with what I saw when I went around the, the more progressive European nations. They had restructured their transportation systems so that people could easily get around by bicycle. And that that replaced a lot of uh, unnecessary combustion. But going back to the question, vehicle purchases are very important. Home purchases are important. Um, a McMansion is going to have a larger carbon footprint than a normal house. The choice of a heating and cooling system is extremely important. So are the uh, decisions to buy um, energy efficient major appliances like a washer dryer or a dishwasher or a refrigerator. Finally, this is very controversial, but having a child is um, uh, a very important decision with climate ramifications. And clearly, each individual that we add to the world's population in an industrialized country like the United States, and I've mentioned earlier, the high per capita um, production of greenhouse gas per person, if you add another person, that person is going to be producing greenhouse gases every year until we are able to transition the economy. So that those are four or five things that we can do. I, I think we should resist the idea though that individuals themselves are responsible for the mess we're in. It, it's a systemic problem that was engineered by the fossil fuel industry, basically, which resisted um, telling people the truth about the damage that continuing to burn fossil fuel would inflict on society. Nevertheless, we're all in it together. And I think that was what was came through for me throughout the book, is that there are ways out of this if we work as a community, as a society, to change our ways. And John, I want to thank you for spending time with us today because it has been an important conversation. Well, it's been a pleasure, and thank you very much for inviting me, Mitch. We've been speaking with the author of Solving the Climate Crisis, Frontline Reports from the Race to Save the Earth, John J. Berger. And we'll include links to find the book in the article that accompanies this podcast. It's also available on Amazon at Powell's Books and local bookstores. I hope you'll buy and read John's book. It's packed with living examples of the transition that is in progress, and as well as the challenges, opponents, and opportunities that will shape our future as a species. Translating our aspirations for a sustainable life as an individual into social change is more complicated than at any time in history. 
not only are we more connected, giving us more power to influence others, we're also inundated with a lot of information, much of it not very useful to making better decisions because it's couched in fear-based storytelling. But John's travels at the front line of the green transition show that the future can be brighter, better, and more equitable than today's economy, which is slowly starving itself due to the pollution and global warming that it, it, that it has produced. Fortunately, sustainable living, responsible business, and profitable community investments are showing the way to a post-fossil fuel world. As he shared, even the deepest red state climate deniers can find reasons to embrace renewable energy and green jobs, which hold the promise of replacing the jobs already lost in the struggling system in which we live today. When you make those big decisions that he talked about, such as buying a new car or truck, choosing a home, a furnace, or appliances, as well as where to live and how to raise your family, take the time to explore the environmental consequences of each decision. The future and our children who will live in it can be burdened by the price that we choose or set free by greener decisions. And stay tuned to Earth 911 for more ideas to help you make the choices that will lead to that brighter, cleaner, and more prosperous world. I also hope you'll take a moment to share this podcast or any of the more than 330 other interviews that we produced on sustainability in your ear. Please write a, a review on your favorite podcast platform to help your neighbors find us because you are the amplifier that can spread more ideas so we create less waste. Tell your friends, family, coworkers, everyone that they can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Audible, as well as all the other places you might pick up a podcast. Please share us on your social media feeds. Thanks, folks, for your support. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe. This is Earth 911, and we will be back with another Innovator interview soon. In the meantime, folks, take care of yourself, take care of one another, and let's all take care of this beautiful planet of ours. Have a green day.